Hal, welcome to the Millhouse. It's great Thanks, to have Andy. you here. And, it's it's uh, great to be here. This is a beautiful place. Thanks for coming, Hal. This is my kind of house. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, the first time I ever felt your presence was when you had the store in Isla Mirada. And I walked in with the big fly rod handles on the in the front door and the tarpon etched in the in the glass and the canoe hanging from the ceiling. It's like this is my house. This, is, this I'm home. And now and, you and have I, it. Now I have <laughs> it. I got the handles in the back room, the tarpon etched on glass. Beautiful. So you have huge influence. Uh, maybe. From a long, long time ago. I don't know if it's good or bad. <laughs> Wasn't there canoes it. hanging from the ceiling and stuff? I think he had one, yeah. In there. Yeah. But um anyway, thank you so much for you know, doing what you've done over these years. I mean, I bought my first Hell's Bay from you when you started the company, and and now we're back together. Yeah, you're building us a boat. I, I can't be more excited about this because all of our friends, Dustin Huff and the, and the guys who are really on the upper echelon, have all gravitated to your product. And we'll get into boat building here in a little bit, but it's funny. It's, 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 it's so cool how everything comes full circle. It know? really does. The um, but let's go back at the top of the show. We just got a new sponsor, Papa Pilar. You know, fishermen like to drink rum. Here's a Papa Pilar, and all the good guys out there, you know, so love it. Th- thanks for jumping on board. It's 9 30, but it's five o'clock somewhere in Papa's <laughs> world. <laughs> drink <laughs> up. I'm gonna put a mark on the top of that bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're starting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's go back. When did when when and where did you get connected to this great? world of ours with the keys and guiding and fishing and all these great players we're going to talk about. You know, my family used to come to the keys every summer for two or three weeks since I was probably, I guess probably seven or eight. Used to go down to marathon, take a boat down there and fish, dive. Didn't know what was really going on, but I loved it. And, um, the more I was down here, the more I saw, I saw skiff guides coming in at the end of the day. And that was a marvel to me push poles, never seen one of those things before. And the guys were talking about catching bonefish and tarpon. And, uh, you know, it was out of my grasp at the time, but, uh, made a lasting impression on me. Who were the players back then that you, that, that, you know, obviously when you're, when you're first involved, you want to catch fish, you want to be out there, but then once you get fairly decent at it, you start hearing names and who's doing what, and eventually you gravitate. There's this, is, there's this gold cup tournament. What's that about? I mean, that's how I got involved. What about you? How did the, your progression start? You know, I, I, live, I grew up in Orlando, but I was in the Keys a fair bit. And I, as soon as I got out of college, I immediately headed for Alamorada to try to get a job and uh, got thrown right out of Worldwide Sportsman. How? <laughs> I walked in there trying to get a job and didn't know who George Hama was, but George was in there. I, I talked to George and he said, you know, you can't work here. He said, I told him I wanted to be a fishing guide. And he said, well, you can't do that. So he tossed me out basically. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it was a closed society back then. Right. You know, an outsider didn't really come in and start guiding. You, know, you had to be kind of part of the scene down here, a local for the most part. And so then you hooked up with Bob Hughes. Is that correct? <laughs> exactly. I had, I had to get a job somewhere. So I got a job working for Bob Hughes up in Miami. Ended up running one of his stores in the Miami River, and uh, spent spent a couple of years doing that. Bob was a great guy. Back then, that was the only skiff you could buy. If you wanted a skiff, you bought that or built your own. I remember. I think my first skiff was a Hughes. Yeah, there was nothing else back then. Right. And so you were working for Hughes, and were you guiding on the side, or was that? that I, I, I got my license after about a year and a half because I've been on the water so much anyway. I had a lot of days in the water, so I, I got my license after a year and a half and started guiding a little bit on the side when I was still working for Bob, and and. After about uh, I don't know, two and a half years, I actually moved to Key Biscayne, started guiding full time. And there were, back then it was uh, Frank Garisto was guiding and Bill Curtis was the, the, the king of Biscayne Bay. And none of them would talk to me. The king of the cutoff? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but he was allowed. He was. Yeah. He was. He was the man. Yeah. So it was kind of funny. I was you know, trying to make a living doing it back then. And nobody would, would throw any excess charters. I could, they didn't pass those things around. I was, I was blind. I, they didn't see me. I was just not there. So I had to go to Miami Beach and you know, pay the concierge and make deals with those guys. So I was just getting hotel charters, which is not what you want, but it was a place to start. What was the fishing like? Scary good. Scary good. The bay was just terrific. Bonefish everywhere. Right up to Key Biscayne. There was a great flat at the end of Key Biscayne called Mashta Flat. 13 right. pound flat 
caught huge bonefish there. Permit fishing was great. Tarpon fishing was great a little farther south off Elliott. Were you were you more gravitating towards being a guide or or an angler? An angler initially, but I but I but I can see how much joy a lot of people have on the back of the boat pushing the boat and finding fish because they too catch most anglers all their fish. There it is, put the fly there. Uh and that fish is caught through that guide. And so they feel, I think, that they're doing as much fishing as they are guiding. Since I was a kid, I was fascinated by guides and captains. And I really wanted to become a guide. Really? Yeah, I really did. You didn't want to be the uh, the guy in the front? I got that feeling about 15 or 18 years later. <laughs> but initially, <laughs> what's, and, what's, yeah. they always say about a promotion being 16 feet forward. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. When I, um, I think I got it for a little over 16 years. I had a lot of really great clients and, you know, the same clients come back every year and take their two, three weeks. Some of them fishing five and six weeks a year with me. So a year in advance, I said, well, guys, this is my last year. And uh, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to move ahead in life 18 feet. Right. (laughs) Off the polling platform and onto the bow. Right. Well, I see your life everywhere you've gone. You've struck lightning in the fact that you were really a successful guide. Your stores were successful. Then you became a boat builder. What is it about that that sa- what, what is it about you that says that success story? You know, I think I don't want to say I get bored with things, but I, I sure like new challenges. Things that are difficult. So you get kind of bored, or actually, once you master something, you you gravitate on. I, I love it. I love guiding just as much, but I, I, I there were other things I wanted to try, and I, I thought I could be successful at it. And, uh, and you were, have yeah, you, was, were you good in school? I was pretty good in school, but to tell you the truth, when I was in college, I, I was in the keys most of the time. <laughs> right. But you've always been yeah. driven then. I, th- I think so. I think so. If I, if I was interested in it, I was driven. Right. So you were a keys guide for 15, 16 years. And when did you go over to Homosassa and who, who were the, who were your big anglers at that time? That's actually kind of interesting. I went to Homosassa the first time to fly fish tarpon when I was 15. Wow. And I had no idea what I was doing. But when I was living in Orlando, I got a job very early on. I was a boat nut. I was completely insane about boats since I was a kid. Really? Yeah, just completely insane about What boats. was it about boats that you were that you were in so it, it was partially with? the fishing, but I loved. My grandmother got me fishing. She was the most dedicated fisherman I ever met in my life. My Your grandmother. grandmother? Oh, yeah. So she was a driving force at a young age? <laughs> Absolutely. She's the one who did it. No kidding. Yeah. She, used to, she used to spring me out of school when I was in elementary school. She'd break me out of school on a Friday. My mother would be gone. I'd fake some kind of pink eye or something, and they'd call my grandmother, <laughs> and she'd break me out of school. We had a camp on Merritt Island. I, I'm sick, and he came back with a sunburn the next day. <laughs> well, we'd be planning to go on the weekend anyway. She would just get me out on Friday morning instead of Friday afternoon. Right. She wanted to get a jump on it. Yeah. It's her idea. <laughs> what kind of fish did you all fish for back then? On Merritt Island, it was, it was big trout, redfish. There were a few snook, but we didn't know about, we didn't understand snook. Right. But trout and redfish we could catch. Yeah. Let's go back. Uh, Nikki just mentioned Homo Sassa, you know, the, the book that just came out yeah. written by Monty Burke, Lords of the Fly. Profiled our sport, the fishery, uh, the captivation of that fish, to, to the anglers and the guides. Um, you know, and it, there's a couple of books that were written, uh, Mile Marker Zero about Key West and the early guys down there being Bronigan, Jim Harrison, Tom McGuane, mm-hmm. the riveting book. They did, the, they did the movie Tarpon. So the players there kind of created this, this, this fever, which grew to the Keys and then obviously up to Home Assassin. And the book portrays all these in, incredible characters as much as the fish, but the characters in Home Assassin. And I love this, the home assassin story. I, I, I love what you guys were doing because that was like the Shea Stadium of, of, of tarpon fishing. Everybody was there to hit a home run every day. Those world records all came from, all the really big fish world records came from there. You know, what was that like? It's, it's the best fishing I ever saw or expect to see. There was nothing like it. it and it can't happen again. It just can't happen again. Walk me through a good day at Homo. I started fishing with some really good anglers. I had the anglers I fished up there were Jim Lopez and and Stu App and people like that. Um, Lenny Burton came up there and fished quite a bit with me. And um, 
Jim Lopez was the best guy I ever had on the boat up there. Really? Yeah. And why? He had it all. He had great eyes, great coordination. He was an athlete. And um, just, he's the single best fisherman I ever had on my boat. What was he like off the water? He was, he was tough. You know, it's kind of a sad thing. He was a lot of fun to be around, but he was a, he was a skunk. Toxic? Yeah, he, he was not a, not a happy guy. He wasn't a pleasant guy. What's a skunk? What do you mean by skunk? You, you couldn't trust him. He, uh, you couldn't trust him. He, uh, he would cheat at cards. He wouldn't really? cheat at fishing. That was one thing that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> but he, he was not a, not a guy that you could trust. Who's the best angler you've had on your bow? I mean, obviously... He just said Jimmy Lopez. But, um, but I'm talking about... Um, yeah, you did say Jimmy Lopez. But here's Stu Apt, the great name. Yeah. The legendary tarpon guy. And you catch two world records in the same day with Stu. One on six-pound fly and one on six-pound conventional. Stu was phenomenal. With any kind of tackle. But Jimmy was better as a fly guy. You know, I have to say, I, I never saw anybody could do what he could do. It was just shocking what he could do on, on bonefish, tarpon, any kind of saltwater fish. He was shockingly good. You know, it's interesting because you see so many guys that have such reverence. But that name is not among the Billy Pates and the Tom Evanses and the Stu Apps. He was, Why hated, is that? he was hated by the guides at the Keys. By the time he got me, he'd gone through a dozen guides. And he didn't treat the guides well. You know, he sometimes he wouldn't pay him. He owed him money. He wouldn't show up one time. The weather get bad and he wouldn't show up. He played by his own rules. But uh, great fisherman nevertheless. Right. And it's kind of a crazy thing that happened with him. You know, he, he had a lot of money. And uh, he was an airline pilot for Delta. When he was 35, he inherited a lot of money. Quit his job immediately. And that year he booked me for, well, we started, we started March 1st, tarpon fishing. It didn't take a day off until the last day of July. Wow. Oh my gosh. Even going to home Sassa, I fished him an Alamorada. It got out black dark, pulled the boat out. I headed for home Sassa. He got in his plane the next morning and flew up there to meet me. And we fished the next day. He was in, he was driven, totally driven, looking for world records. But, uh. Uh, being as toxic as he was, what was it like being on the same boat with him after all that, that time? You know, I just, loved it just because doable. It, I loved it because he was so good. Right. But he wasn't a great guy to be around. Right. He was, he was, he was pretty tough. He had a terrible temper. He had broken a number of fly rods. He, he didn't love the sport for the right reasons. He loved it, but he didn't love it for the right reasons. I remember one day in Homosassa, we probably had, you know, 15, 18 fish on, and of course, we're a world record fishing, so if it didn't look like a record, he'd break the fish off immediately. Didn't waste time fighting them. Right. And we had a lot of I fish. I think on. a lot of those, those guys did that, except for maybe Evans. I think yeah, I right. think Billy did that. Billy talking did about it. rats breaking off 125 pound oh, yeah. fish. Oh yeah. Yeah. So he had this one day and we had we had about four or five, we're fishing 12 pound. And he had four or five fish on, and three or four of those fish could have potentially been a world record. And something went wrong and fly pulled in all of them and just Never got him close to the boat. And he got mad at the end of the day. On his last fish when the fly came out, he broke his rod in half. And so let's get the hell out of here. I've had it. I mean, he said one of the greatest days anybody on the planet will ever have. And he was unhappy about it. So he just didn't quite see the overall scheme. It's interesting the demons people have. Yeah. Let's, let's go to that, that day in, uh, with Stu over by Flamingo where you catch those two world records in the same day. And by the way, this fish here is a 82 pound four ounce fish i caught on six when Stu's record was still in place for like 25 years uh, and so, so close we missed Stu's record by four ounces with this fish exactly so you caught that you caught those fish in uh, flamingo with them we did oh yeah. i didn't know that we did i think one was in and one was in uh the basin yeah in uh, sandy key basin mm -hmm. tell me about that day it was a great day because we'd uh Stu is notorious for great preparation and we planned that day exactly. It was one of those things that actually worked out the way you plan it. So I tied the flies. Stu and I rigged the tippets that night. You know, everything was perfect. Probably had a dozen or 15 tippets tied up. And uh, set up the six pound, got it all perfect. Had three outfits all rigged up in case you had to break a few off. And we got there and the first bloody fish we hooked was plenty big enough. I think back then the record was only 30 some pounds. So that fish was easily big enough. Right. 
And, and it, you guys caught that pretty quickly, like within an hour, right? We or did. Or something like that? I think that fish may have jerked me over the side. Really? <laughs> I think so. I had two or three. I you know what? I, I think, Stu, I, I spoke with I Stu a couple of days ago about, about yeah. fishing with you. And he said, yeah, I think he got. Uh, yeah, yeah, he got snatched over. What's that like? It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Talk about a, a lightning bolt in your ass getting lost. You know what? It's, it's a fi- actually, big firecracker. <laughs> so many, so many world records have been lost on the gaff, and the truth is, it's easy once you go in the water with them, because they may swim off forty or fifty or sixty, seventy yards with you. But as soon as you, they'll slow down at some point. You work your way up on the gaff, and if they're down deep, you just push down their back and they swim to the surface, and then it's all over. Same thing happened with Winnie Berg's fish on the 10 pound record. With you? Mm hmm. And Homosassa. So, how big was that fish? 128 and a half. On 10 pound? 10 pound. Then, but they eliminated the 10 pound tip. They did. Too bad. That's a great well, category. Know, I would think that they would leave that in place. I don't know why they did. It was such a beautiful category. You know, it was finesse, but you could still pull on them with 10 pound, but it was still. And it was 128? 128. And that's the record on eight now. Yes. Yes, is it, is it it's, really? it's uh, Del Brown and okay. Steve Huff. It's got a they got a one twenty seven and a half on yeah. eight. Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. on eight. That was a crazy fish with Lenny. You know, he I think he came up and had two weeks with me, and I said, "What do you want to do, Lenny?" Well, I was trying to get all the world records on fly on tarpon. You were, yeah. I wanted all my clients to have it at the same time, and I had two at that point. I think I said, "Lenny, why don't we break? Uh, why don't we go after Billy's ten pound record?" But what two records did you have at the time? I think I had the six. Which was Stu's. Yeah, I had the six, and I might have had the 15 at that point with Billy. And what was that, 150-something? 182. Oh, that was already up to that high. I think so, yeah. Wow. So Lenny agreed to do that thing, and it was pretty funny. He'd never fished 10-pound tippet before, and Lenny's a good fisherman. And he had his son with him to drive the boat, which is a big help, trying to trying to take For a target. Sure. You need a third person. You need three, three you people. you got to have three people. Yeah. So we'd broken off four or five fish that were big enough and Homo Sassa, heck, you're going to have world records on every day. And I said, Lenny, let's try something different on this fish. Let's not try to fight the fish too early. Let's just hang on to this thing. Don't even set the hook. Just come tight, let go of the line. Teeny little hooks, he's going to probably hook himself, which he did. And this thing took off and went offshore, way offshore. And we fought this fish and oh, they we're probably out in you know, 12 feet of water, way out 12 miles, 13 miles out. Wow. And I had his son, Elliot, driving the boat. And I said, look, ease up on the fish and get the boat used to us. Or get the fish used to the Comfortable. boat. Comfortable. Yeah. yeah. So after about the 15th time, I said, this time when he gets a little, when, he, when you get close to him, punch it a little bit. And he did. And I reached out and hooked this thing. And I told him, I said, look, I'm going out of the boat. You, go, you went swimming? Yeah. I said, this one's going to jerk me out of the boat. I said, shut the engine off so you don't run over me. So... They did, everyone went according to plan. I hit the fish. He dragged me out of the boat, dragged me 40, 50 yards. I got him under control. Got back to the surface, and I'm yelling for him. I said, Look, come get me, because there's big big tigers out there. I know. I didn't want to be floating around there feeding a tiger. I had a big shark over at home. Oh, eat yeah, one of my fish. Bad ones. So I didn't hear anything. It was flat, calm, and I couldn't see anything. You're all pumped up after this. I couldn't see anything. But where the hell are they? And I could hear them talking. They had a problem. They broke the key off. <sighs> So they finally got the boat over to me. We got in the boat and um, we were all high five and we're all happy as can be. Got the fish in, I got all set up. I said, let's run in, let's run way in. I jumped the boat on a plane. I went, where are we? I can't see anything. Well, I didn't realize it, but I knocked my contacts out. I couldn't see anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we made it back in anyway. That was a glorious day. So now you got this, 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 this potential world record fish. You know, you hang him on a hook and you see that. You see that scale go, you know, past that, that mark. It's exciting. It's an ex- hunting big tarpon is a, well, you know better than anybody. It's an exciting sport. And world record fishing is tough. Yeah. You don't hang many fish. You go for years between that. Talk to me about uh, maybe Ted Williams. Do you ever fish with him? I know Al Fluger, you fished with Al, right? Yeah, Over I, in Homo. Yeah, you know, I didn't fish with Al, but I was beside Al a lot of times. Right. He was a great guy. What's up with this guy? He's a six foot six guy and he couldn't catch a fish. He didn't want to pull. Right? Well, walking I mean, his, walking, walking the, the dog. dog. <laughs> <laughs> his stories yeah. are legendary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe he liked the liked the fight. Just like to extend it. But I remember seeing him many times just there he goes, off the <laughs> over the, over the <laughs> yeah. curvature of the earth. Yeah. Fishing by himself? No, no, no. no. He was always no, fishing. He, had... he was fishing with somebody. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's a great fisherman with any kind of tackle. <clears throat> what about Ted Williams? Oh, I got to fish with Ted maybe a half dozen times. One of the one of the greatest characters I'll ever meet. You know, he lived in town, and it, Island Brothers was such a small place back then. You know, he, Ted was just one of the guys. You know, he'd show up in a tackle store, and you know, he's just one of the guys. But I got to, the first time I got to fish with him, I was oceanside tarpon fishing with him, and he didn't like casting platforms, so I took my platform off. He's standing on the bow, and. I had great eyes back then, and I'm on a polling platform, so I should be able to see the fish before anybody. And he's spotting these fish before I can see them. And he's spotting the singles that are down deep. I'm going, I didn't believe it to start with. He could just see beyond anything that I thought a human being could ever see. And uh, he was a freak. I mean, he was telling me stories about when he was playing baseball. He said, the bow spell looked like a slow motion cantaloupe coming at him. At 90 miles an hour? Yeah. Yeah, but he, he had the greatest eyes I've ever seen. I, I heard that Ted loved a real slow rod. He the did rod have, could he not had be soft slow rods. enough for him. Yeah, he had soft rods. Yeah. Oh, he get mad too. Was he a good fish fighter? He, yeah, he was, he was a good all-around fisherman. He wasn't the best caster, but he was a good caster. He was a great fisherman. Right. He knew where the fly needed to be, but boy, he had a temper. He got mad one day and blew a couple of casts and... Uh, it was his own tackle. You know, Ted Williams ran tackling. He smashed that rod to a million pieces. <laughs> down. Didn't he call everyone Bush or something? He did. Everybody. Yeah. One day, you remember Mike Hyman? Did you ever know Mike Hyman? No. He had a small tackle store in Alamorada, a little tackle store. And I had a rod building business. I always had a half dozen fly rods in his shop, one consignment. And it was a place, you know, on a weather day, we just all used to hang out in the tackle store. Mike was a great guy and a great fisherman. So we're, it's a little teeny shop and we're all hanging out. The Billy Knowles is there and a couple other guides are in there. We had nothing else to do on a, on a wind day. So Ted comes walking in, you know, in his khaki pants and a white t-shirt. And that was his standard attire. Yeah, yeah he, it was. And uh, he goes, Sage had just come out with a eight foot nine, eight weight. And I had a rod building shop and I, I was building the blanks and the, and the rods. So Ted heard about this rod. He said, where's that new Sage rod? Let's go cast it. So we grabbed a reel let it with the line and walked out back of, of Mike shot there. We're casting this thing and he grabs it first and you know, he's pretty strong and powerful. He, he, he throws about a, you know, an 80 foot cast with this thing and he just throws the rod at me and goes, beat that bush. Well, he, he knows what's going on because I can cast a long way. So he said three shots to beat that cast. So I, I make two lame shots. Then I strip out like 20 more feet of line. They're 115 foot lines back then. And I smoked this thing. And Billy Knowles is watching this. I smoke this line. It's just flying out there. Got the rod up like this. And it's going to come to the, a snapping end. Before the line gets out, bam, he tackles me from behind. <laughs> I mean, he tackles me. I go down. He's on top of me, pounding me and shrieking with his fist and laughing like a maniac. Oh, that fun. was so cool. How fun. Yeah, he was intense. But what a, what a great guy. What do you miss most about that, that generation? God, I miss the whole whole way the place worked back then it was so small as far as the number of people but right it was a much bigger place back then a little fraternity of guys yeah. camaraderie you, you knew every boat on the water every skiff you could go to key west and you knew every skiff on the water go to biscayne bay you know every skiff on the water even if it was a private but you know who owned it right that was pretty cool the pressure was very reduced back then what is, and you were involved with the gold cup mm -hmm. who'd you fish in that I fished, I fished a number of people. I fished Stu App one time. That was the best How time. How come he never won that? You know, I was thinking about that on the drive up this morning because I thought you might ask that question. You know, he's 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 the man, but and the Gold Cup was the tournament. He wanted to win. He it. never and Evans, Tom Evans never won it. Yeah. Stu App never won it, and it was a kill tournament back then, big oh, yeah. fish kill tournament. But he yeah. never won. It was a hardcore tournament with some good fishermen. Right. The the year he and I fished it, it was the craziest thing. So you fished the Gold Cup with him once? or Just one time. Yeah. And he is, I mean, he's still a good fisherman. Right. But he, he was unbelievable. I, I kind of hit him at the wrong time. He and I, I kind of grew up fishing with him when I was guiding. I, I, was, I was fishing with him a lot before I started guiding. Learned a ton from him. But what happened with him on the Gold Cup, he couldn't see. He didn't realize it. But he's a fire pilot. His I eyes know. were bad. He had they bad, went. They he, just they happened. He signed a contract with a shitty sunglass company or something. They. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't realize it. You know, you just you sometimes don't realize what's happening. 
And of course, he hadn't been fishing a ton during tarpon season, but he just, he didn't realize what was happening. He just didn't have, he had just sunglasses that weren't prescription. He couldn't see. Oh. And it was horrible. You would think somebody like that would know the difference. He just didn't realize it. He just didn't realize it. He started realizing it after the end of, you know, we fished a couple of days before the tournament and it wasn't going well. At the end of the tournament, he said, I can't see these fish. I mean, he's seen more fish than anybody. Right. And we'd have unbelievable, he should have won the tournament going away. He had because so you shots. found so many fish. We had there were a ton of fish, right? And when you find Stu fish, he catches them, right? I mean, he just doesn't miss. He catches fish. I just wrote this article for Tail Magazine talking about about drag and pulling on fish. I learned from Harry Spear where you set the drag very light, so if the fish jumps, he's not falling against a heavy resistance and hanging onto the fly line and. and, and locking up and backing that fish up and knowing what the breaking strength is so you can let go prior to the break off. And um, I was thinking recently about how many people out there use drags. And when I see somebody on TV fishing and I see them have their rod in their hand, they're not connected to their fly line and, you know, they crank in the reel side. I think this guy has no idea. Clueless. No clue. What the there's fuck? your drag yes here's your drag. here's your drag right. right there so i was thinking how can i help people uh that don't know how to hang on to the fly line they've never learned that way and what drag means and nikki and i've been fishing this last couple of years and so on my on my reel i i, I mark now i used to pull off drag and say, oh that feels good but what is what does feel good and when you pull hard what does hard mean and when you tell somebody pull harder what do they do they lift the rod harder. All they're doing is wasting time. Well, well, it's funny on the on the drag situation. We thought we always set a light drag. Well, I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah. And so we always thought it was like five, four or five pounds of drag. <coughs> and we, when we actually measured it on it's a boga, pound. it's like two pounds. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So yeah. the article I wrote is telling people that if they actually measure resistance on their drag. This is say you your first setting is at five pounds for tarpon fishing. So that's you have a mark. Now you increase the drag and you go to ten pounds. And hypothetically, we want to pull on fish at twelve pounds of resistance. And what's interesting, measuring drag and resistance, if I've got if I pull straight back and set my drag at ten pounds, what's the difference with a straight rod? here versus a bent rod fighting a fish and the friction through the coils. And once I measured that, come to find out that's about 20% difference. So if you're fighting a fish at five pounds with a bent rod, by the time it gets to the drag, it's six pounds. And 10 pounds of drag is actually 12 pounds. So a lot of times <clears throat> when you have a fish closer to the boat, let's just say if you're fishing, you know, you might have that drag a little bit lighter than 10. But once that fish gets close and he's tired, he's not going to jump so much. If you have a mark on your drag in the wall at 12 pounds or 10 pounds, when that fish is closer to the boat, it's actually like 12. But if that fish goes under the boat, if you can't have, if you don't have the time to walk that rod around the bow, you're going to break that rod on the gunnel. Mm -hmm. So you can take the drag completely off. There's no resistance. You walk it around. The other side, you go right to 10. So you mark the reel. So I was doing an interview with, with Stu for my book. And we went on, out into the backyard. And I was really curious as to, you know, this whole conversation about drag and, and how much resistance. And he, I asked him, I said, how much resistance do you like to use in fighting your big tarpon? He said 12 pounds. I said, okay. I got a boca grip out because I was looking forward to doing this. Got a rod out, tied a knot on the end of his leader. He stood back. I said, go to 12. He fucking went right to 12. I said, how do you know? He said, he I just know. He knows. Because you had so many fish back then. And he, the U.S., they fished a lot of 12 pounds. They broke so many fish off on 12. Yeah. They learned through experience and fighting fish and breaking fish off what 12 was. But we don't have that luxury in today's world. If we go fishing, we're lucky to catch a fish. So I was hoping to, you know, to teach people. You can learn, you know, by pulling in your garage with a 12-pound barbell hung through a pulley. Learn how to, how to fight there. But getting back to Stu and what these guys knew and what you guys knew, it was fascinating about how refined their fish fighting skills were. 
Yeah, it w- it was refined, and they had great touch, and he he still does. These guys still do. Do you I, believe in the down and dirty that's that Stu always promoted? It works. How do you it think works. it works? You know, I've I've seen Stu, and matter of fact, um, I've seen him use it. I think we used it on, uh, well, on some big fish we we've, we've caught together. He's used that technique, and I've done it. You know, sometimes when that fish flips over, they give up. Well, they get disoriented. Yeah, they they they. they I get that. So you can, you can get them quick at that point. But I've what I've experienced too. When and it's always kind of fun to see that fish out there, and you start to pull low, and that tail comes up, and yeah. all of a sudden they do a headstand and they yeah. flip over. Yeah, the hook comes out. <laughs> every time, every they, all of a sudden they get flipped over, and they're facing the boat. Here comes the here comes the hook. Yeah, that's happening. so. It, it I does. only do that when the fun day of fishing. But when I was fishing tournaments, I would never do that. But yet here, Tom Evans, he's so much different in his fish fighting skills, in that he always believed the rod never went between tw- uh, ten and two. And he fought the fish with really a high rod, trying to pick their head up and hold their head. And once I started to think about resistance in 12 pounds, it is really almost impossible to put 12 pounds of resistance. You can't hold it for very long. You have no no leverage. I mean, up here you have the rod against your waist, maybe down here a little bit. But with a bent rod, all that pressure goes right to your bicep. It does. Straight rod. Yeah. Straight rod moves the fish. Yeah. But that was all right for Tom to do because he used to fish really stiff rods, right? Well, also, so he's, 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 strong. Just, he's as strong as, as my truck outside. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's 270 pounds. But that was his methodology. Yeah. Somewhere in between might be the best thing. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I've always told Nikki, control. just pull your ass off and don't worry about... Yeah, you know what? Here too, I used to think that the Sherpas in Nepal can carry a lot, a big load of weight because they're it's anatom- the load is anatomically in line with their spine. Sure. Once you get that load over here, you can't go fifty yards. So that's where fighting fish in the angles, turning their head to the side and maybe getting low briefly to throw them off balance, and then you rip twelve pounds. Yeah, that works. That's what Stu does. That's what Flip does. The guys who've done a lot of it, it, it works really well. Yeah, I, li- I like how I don't like a high rod that much. It works you too hard. Well, yeah, because it all goes to the bicep. Yeah, you're killing yourself. You can pull twelve, but f- yeah. I, I, I I challenge anybody to lift that rod tip fairly high and lift that twelve pound barbell off the floor. Hold it there five minutes. Hold it for thirty seconds. You can't do it. You can't do yeah, it. You can't hard. do it. You've got to lift yeah. with your legs and with you do. fairly straight arms. You do. And a fairly straight rod to really move the yeah. fish. I hate to be giving everybody a fishing lesson here, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind so of fun important. to talk about dynamics. I mean, you've caught really big world record fish. And it's interesting to hear you speak about, you know, Stu and, the, and these legendary guys. You ever fish with Evans? Yeah, you know, fish beside him a million times. Spent, I home assassin one year, we lived next to each other, right. Riverside Villas. So I spent right. a ton of time around him, but. Never been on the boat with him. What about the bo- the mobster Bobby era? He spent a lot of time around Bobby. I, you know, I met Bobby probably about uh, 1975, four or five. He had a place in the Keys, and um, he was a real interesting character. He was a real complex guy. He, you um, think? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was. Uh, you know, we all know what Bobby did. Yeah. You know, he went to jail for for some serious stuff, but he had rules. They might have been our rules, but he had rules that he lived by. And as long as you knew the rules, you were okay. What were his rules? You know, he, um, he had a, he, he had an honor system. You know, if Bobby told you something, he did it. Um, it wasn't our rules, but he, he, um, give me an example. You know, he had a terrible temper, really terrible temper, but he had a set of rules. And if you live within that box, within, within his rules, you had no problem. But if you got outside that and did something he thought was uh, ungentlemanly, believe it or not, that sounds crazy, but he was a kind of a, a gentleman. And who was his guy? Was it John Kip? John spent an awful lot of time with him and Flip Pallet did too. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Right. Flip fished him for a number of years. Tell me about all the uh, the stuff that was taking place in Isla Mirada with new other guides coming down. And their tires were getting slashed and all that kind of nonsense. Yeah, that did happen. You know, 
I was thinking about on the drive down this morning. There were so many rules back then for the fishery, and they worked so well. You know, the guides knew where to go, where we could go, where we'd run certain times a year, where we didn't run certain times a year. We knew etiquette. You know, if somebody was fishing in a particular spot, we knew, well, we can go behind him, or no, we can't even get near that guy. That's a one fish spot, a one boat spot. And, and that was so important. We've lost that now. And you know the problems it causes. There's, it's, it's huge problems out there. Um, in the 70s and 80s, you didn't violate the rules. The guides had rules. Anglers had rules. Everybody knew what they were. And there were repercussions for not following the rules. There were. And essentially, you know, if somebody made a mistake and didn't know, somebody would nicely explain to them, well, you really, here's why we don't do that. Here's the reason we don't do that. Well, here's why we don't run this lake a certain time of year, or we don't get in front of somebody because this is where the fish are coming from and you're blocking their fish. Generally speaking, people, when they hear about that, they go, oh, I understand. That makes sense to me. And they don't do it again. If they did it a second time, they would get a little more harsh warning. If they did it a third time, their boat might sink. Tell me about that. Specifically? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear it. Um, Whose well, boat? I'm, Who I'm, sank it? Um, I'm not giving you any names or numbers, but <laughs> come but, on. But, but, but <laughs> this is the mill house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those people are still alive. <laughs> yeah. We'll go with initials. <laughs> Okay. Um, a number of boats got sunk. A number of boats got burned up. Actually, the most artful one was called the sarcophagus. If there was a guy, and he, you know, back then we used to leave our boats in the water frequently at tarpon season. We're fishing every day and getting back in black dark and leaving it early in the morning. So we had the boats tied up. Well, this one particular boat that was particularly offensive and just didn't seem to want to learn got, got up one morning and Someone had taken about 30 gallons of fiberglass resin and kicked it off very hot and a lot of fiberglass cloth. And they had completely encapsulated the boat and his bow line and his stern line, engine, pulling platform, everything got completely encapsulated in fiberglass with a with a hot fiberglass poured all over it. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was one solid piece. The sarcophagus. Oh, my God. You're a boat builder. <laughs> you throw it away. There's <laughs> nothing you can do. <laughs> but the problem was solved. Yeah, I'm sure, I was going to say, I'm sure you didn't cut anyone off after that. Yeah, he, that guy actually never came back. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Does, that, does that mean I'm lucky to have my boat still floating? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah you're gonna get, cut anybody off. You're going to get sand in your gas tank very soon. <laughs> the sad thing, it was very peaceful back then because everybody knew what the rules were. If you didn't, you learned what the rules were and you fit in. Now, nobody seems to care. Did you see the uh, TV series Bloodline in the Keys? Yes, I saw part of it. How much of a reality it, was that back in the day? You know, with drug running, oh, guides. Oh, it was prolific. daily. It was it was going on all the time. It was it was the economy of the Keys. Because I asked Craig Brewer, and he said, "No, nah, I had nothing. To, we were not even similar." But I, but I've been in. There I, I, didn't, I didn't like the show. I thought they portrayed, portrayed portrayed the keys badly. Right. But 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 the underlying connotation yeah. was pretty similar. Oh yeah. To those early years. Oh, it was uh, it was the economy of the keys. It really was. Yeah. You, you knew who was doing and it. And a few guys, a, f a few friends of ours, went away to college, as uh, they say. Plenty. Yeah. The big house. Yeah. The big house. And we we have a roll call at the guides association. It'll be uh, summer camp, summer camp. <laughs> yep, summer camp. <laughs> Offshore, they was, that was even worse. The offshore guys were heavily involved in it. Right. A lot of guys got busted. Tell, so me, kinda... about, tell me about um, about Flip. You've been very close to him for a long time. You started Hell's Bay with him. Yeah. What was your relationship like over you know, those years? I, I met Flip when I was really young. And uh, I was probably like 23. And uh, when it comes to hunting and fishing, there's nobody better. He is... Superb. He's the man, isn't he? He's superb. Yeah, he's, he's the real deal. He's real, real, real deal. Really yeah. gifted. Yeah, he can turn flip loose with a longbow in Florida, and pick him up a year later, he'd weigh more. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he can live off the land. Yeah, and he does. I love flip. So I'm going to transition a little bit. You said you guided for 15, 16 years, right? And I heard that you had 16 different skiffs during that period of time. 16 or 17, I did. So you were obviously not satisfied with one skiff. Was I that hated every one of them. So, okay, so was that the driving force of starting Hell's Bay? 
It really was. I thought at some point, I, I, I opened my retail stores in between, but I thought at some point I'm going to build a real skiff. And then that was Chris Moore, John, yourself and Flip? Yes. Yep. Chris is an old friend. Chris is a very bright guy. And I, I met him when I was guiding. In fact, he built a couple of skiffs for me. You know, he would take an existing boat. He built up a super skiff for me and a, an old Mako. He'd redo it and make it a little lighter. But I knew Chris would be the right guy. He was, Chris used to be in the in the Keys and he'd work for a few years and he'd go to the Bahamas and sail and be gone for years, come back when he needed to make some more money. So I tracked him down to the Bahamas and said, I want to build a boat company, Chris. He said, okay, well, I'll come back and I'll, I'll do it. I only do 10 boats and I'm going back to the Bahamas. No kidding. Yeah. So I sold 10 boats before we started the first one. And uh, Chris stayed for about two and a half years. What's the key to a great boat? I mean, it's evolved over the years, obviously. So did this is go to the initial, the, the early years of, of Hell's Bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's, believe it or not, building a skiff is the most difficult boat I'll ever try to build. We're going to build boats up into the mid-60s and 70s of this new company. But the hardest boat to design is a skiff because it has so many requirements that no other boat has. I, I know naval architects, and I went to several naval architect friends of mine when I wanted to build a skiff, and I said, I want to build a bonefish skiff and a tarpon skiff really right. And they thought, oh, that's a great project. Uh, they'd love to be part of that. Then you start explaining to them why the chines can't be where they normally are in any boat and why pressure waves are a problem and all the other requirements for a boat. And both my friends and naval architects said, you know what? You ought to do that yourself because it's, I don't understand what you're trying to do. They said, go do it yourself because we can't help you. No kidding. Yeah, it's too complicated. You're taking away everything that they've learned and naval architecture school and, and changing it because there's so many things we're trying to do and these fish are more sophisticated all the time. So I learned a lot at Hell's Bay. We made a big start there and, uh, and the boats were good. And, and the, the first Hell's Bay boat you guys created was the Whipray? It was. So I've got the 2002 out, out there. When was the first year? No, we have a Waterman, not or a Whipray. Waterman, right. So yeah, we built the Whipray first in 1997. We started working on that. Then the second boat we built was the uh, the guide, which is a very wide version. Right. And um, then the seventeen eight after that, which is a whip ray, which just with boxes on the back, just for additional flotation, so you could put right. a larger motor on it. Right. It was a mistake. We shouldn't have built the boxes on. We knew it going in, but there was a reason we did that. We were building a lot of boats for yachts at the time, sport fishermen. Right. And they have a limited amount of space on their bow, and by having the boxes on the back and insetting the motor forward you could save almost 18 inches on the bow of a sport fishing boat so you could put that boat on the bow interesting so we gave them a little bit larger boat with a larger engine but still got a got it on a fairly small sport fisherman well your new company um chittam obviously um your boat is the ferrari of skiffs as well as the rolls royce the ferrari being thane morgan's and dustin huff's uh skiff that they're winning all these tarpon uh, tournaments with. That's an 80 mile an hour boat. 84. 84 miles an hour. Looking for 90. Right. What the fuck? It's Somebody's crazy. Somebody's going to die. Oh, it's, it's very dangerous. It's very, you know, Dustin was up last week for a couple of days. We're working on his boat, trying to get, he wants 90 miles an hour out of it. Does he really? Yeah. And we made is that. It. Is that just a number? Because I, t I was speaking with Thane last night. I said, you're already beating everybody to your spot. Why do you want to go another 20, 15 miles an hour faster? Well, Just we wanted because to, he can? We he wanted wanted to, there, there's another there. reason. We wanted to make the boat safer, if possible. So we pulled his boat out a few months ago, turned it upside down, derigged it, and put a wide flat pad on it. Just to see if we could make it more stable. Because that boat at 75 miles an hour was not stable to say the least right because it's not flat on the on the pad on the back is yeah, there still a little curvature uh is that yeah but it, it was just it's an extremely light boat and trying to drive a boat with a boat motor that weighs way more than the boat does in these horrible speeds nobody's ever done it before i mean you get these guys are blowing trim tabs off the boat oh yeah ripping trim tabs off the boat it's a uh, it's dangerous but you know dustin and thane that's their mindset they uh they live on the edge the faster the better you know we've always spoken about tournament fishing and people think that tournament fishing is sacrilegious because fishing you're supposed to be out there and not competing and it's it's everything that fishing does not embrace itself to 
But tournament fishing over the years has improved technology with fly rods and reels and hooks and monofilament in boats. Is this the new cutting edge of that whole dynamic with this boat that you guys are building? I would think. The, the, boat's, the boat's letting us do things we couldn't do before. It's letting us- It's showing fun. you things that you, you've never thought possible. It really is. The fish are more sophisticated. The fish are much more sensitive than they used to be. And uh, this is letting people catch fish closer that aren't alerted. They aren't bothered by the by the boat. So now much. we're talking about about the stealthiness of your boat. The stealthiness, Versus yeah. the speed and, the, and exactly. the durability. Yeah. You can have both now. You can have both. But uh, it, it was a real challenge to do that. We spent, I spent a million dollars before I built the first boat. Two and a half years trying to develop this thing. What was the biggest... Uh, light bulb that went off in in that new development with this new product God, one of the ones was we're trying to make a dry boat and how do you make a dry boat that's not noisy that was the that was a catch-22 so i was talking to my partner one night we we're trying to develop this boat and we we were working with a naval architect who would we'd come in and tell him the problems he would blueprint it we'd go back and cut the boat reshape the boat and try it again over and over and over again. We weren't getting anywhere. It was going backwards. And so I'm talking to my partner, George, one night about 11 o'clock. And he goes, I said, we got to get the spray rail higher where it doesn't engage the water. But, but I don't know how to do that. And he, he draws a picture, takes a picture of a cell phone and, and, and emails it to me while we're talking. I went, well, damn, that's it. That's it. I think it's going to work. He goes, it might. So we Try it the next, uh, about 10 days later, we had it on the boat, and it, and it worked well, really well. I, I heard a rumor that you were going to try to start a, or make a skinny water, shallow water boat for pulling in those bites, you know, a mile, maybe two miles in, oh, yeah. that you could actually row yes. with oars. Yeah. And instead of pulling in your your push pull sink in a foot foot and a half and losing you know momentum exactly you'd sit in the middle and or in i mean that makes all the well, sense in the world just to get in and get out but here's here's the question if you're rowing in this much water the row can't get into the water to pull but it, it can in get mud. in even if it's muddy it works well so you just stick it in the mud you stick it in the mud but that it's really, sense. it really actually, you're more efficient when, stick, when you're makes in the mud, so much sense. there's no wasted motion. When you pull, it drives it forward. Yeah, How far away from that? Oh, we're there. We're there. I'm building one right now for a guy. In fact, we just built a pretty cool one. We built a, uh, that same exact boat. It's our two degree version of the, the boat you're getting almost flat. So we built him this boat and he's got a 41 Bahama with quad engines on the thing. And he lifts the boat up on top of the thing with a, a miniature looking trailer almost, pulls it on top of the center console and he runs the Bahamas at 60 miles an hour with the skiff on top. <laughs> so that's a super light boat. What does that uh, boat weigh? The unrigged right at 300 pounds. Wow. Light as we can build it. So we'll do the same thing for, with, uh, for these no motor zones and have a pair of oars put the oars away as soon as you find the fish. But you know, that beautiful area north of Lake Ingram is a monster area. You know, it's sure. 15 miles to 20 miles. It's mm -hmm. huge. And it's, sometimes it's the best fishing in Florida. And it's unaccessible. It's very hard part. to get to. Yeah. You have to work to get to it. Yeah. That boat can get in. Those fish are in four inches of water, five inches of water. Snooker have almost their eyeballs out. And very few boats will float in there. And this so the, the future of Chittum, you, you mentioned that earlier, the future of Chittum might be Offshore boats, bay boats, and sport fishing boats? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're taking every category of saltwater boats that we're interested in and and trying to improve it. Well, my, my, my question, Hal, is I've got I've had a bunch of bay boats, and they're all too late. I get offshore if I want to take, you know, the boats that I once had. I get offshore, and the wind blows the bow. Mm -hmm. They bounce around like corks. Will your offshore boats be heavier so it sits deeper in the water column so it can hold its line? They, they will be engineered to, to stay in the water and hold the line. But Cause, they're cause light be, they're, boats don't, I don't think light boats work well offshore. You'll have to try it. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. When I was getting ready to do this, this company, I, I was worried about building boats that were too light. We didn't know. And I thought we might go too light. And so I, my naval architect sent me to a man in, in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, who had a phenomenal company, a naval engineering company called High Modulus. I got over there and they were engineering seven America's Cup boats 
that's beyond sophisticated. That's right. beyond aircraft. They, that's an unholy. That's beyond money. Uh, unlimited. Unlimited. They, one, they're engineering seven different countries, America's Cup boats, under one roof. And uh, that's crazy when you think about it because the secrecy involved is right. unparalleled. And he let me see a study they did for the U.S. government, for the Navy. The Navy was having problems. All the special operators, whether it's Navy SEALs, and there's lots of special operators, no matter what group they are, the Navy delivers them. And regular Navy drive the boats. They have a navigator and a driver. And the special operators just get on the boat and ride and get delivered and hopefully picked up. The Navy guys were, were getting beat to death doing this every day. They weren't lasting very long. I mean, it was just compressing their, their spines. It was just tearing them up. So the Navy wanted to know, what do we do about this? Is a heavy boat better than a light boat? So this company and, and high modulus did a study for the Navy and it was a, and they knew the answer already. They knew the answer, but they had to prove it to them, show it to them in black and white. And they proved conclusively that a, a light boat properly designed hits much less hard than a heavy boat. So you get a better ride out of a light boat. It was a very comforting thing to me because I was getting ready to spend a lot of money on a skiff that I thought might not work because it was so light. So, and now all the boats are being built that way in the last 15 years, all the, all the boats are built very, very light. And there's you know, uh, you know, 30 to 70 foot offshore boats. I mean, they're, they're obviously much smarter than I am, but I just have a hard time believing that if I want to run through some heavy water, I want a, I want a sledgehammer pushing through that, that rough water versus a, a, a tin So top. it's not really pushing through. It's coming down and it's going down. When it's displacing, it away, right? It, it, it's when, it, when you hit a big wave, you hit that wave and the boat goes down. It comes back up. It hits another wave like right. that. That's where this company put hundreds and hundreds of sensors into each boat. They had a heavy boat and a light boat built the same. One was I mean, the same design. And the, and the lightweight boat hits much less hard, like half as hard as the heavy boat. Heavy boat coming down hits much, much more impact on the people inside than the light boat, which kind of just chips through the water. But would a carbon fiber boat hit hard because it's so stiff versus a boat that's got a little bit more glass in it? it, it it's the shape that does it mostly. Uh -huh. it's, it's really the shape. Yeah, the carbon sounds, it is hard, but you, know, you can engineer it so that it has a minute amount of give. You don't want to have it completely locked out so it can't move at all. Right. But yeah, carbon is a wonderful, it's almost all we're using now. So it's all space technology. It comes from aerospace. Most of it comes from aerospace. Yeah. It's funny, whenever I see photos of you, Hal, or I've, I've seen you at the boat shows, you've always worn a hat that says Chittam Yachts. And I've always wondered, it's sure. not Chittam Boats or Chittam Skiffs. Has that, has that been like intended foresight to like... Well, the reason we did that, actually some years ago, we had, we had bad timing. We had two 68-foot sport fishermen sold. We were two weeks away from starting the boats when the BP oil spill hit. Oh. And both the boats are going to go there. One was a friend of ours who fished all the sailfish tournaments. And he had a, a 60 foot sport fisherman built in Carolina, but the ride wasn't great. And he was going to start fishing the Marlin tournaments in the Gulf all the way around to, to Cabo. And uh, he needed a boat that could run farther and faster. And we were going to build him that boat. He was going to have a 50 knot boat, 68 foot, 50 knot boat. So we had the whole thing engineered, designed, ready to go when the BP oil spill hit and locked everybody out. All the tournaments went out of business in the, in the Gulf for a while. And, so, uh, what's, so what's your target now besides having the, the best flat skiff in the world? Are you going to target the merits of the world and the Vikings? You know, we really don't care about building 75 foot sport fishermen right. because it's not a, it's just not a fishing boat. Yeah. You know, we've got a, we've got a design for a 50, something under 60 feet or under. So GNS is, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That kind of a boat. Exactly. N name a couple more dad. Let's see how knowledgeable you are in the offshore world. <laughs> I can't. My either, son's a fuckhead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can build a boat like that. Game that's, fishers. What, uh, yeah, I always heard about the game fisher. That yeah, that's a great vessel. It, it's it's a classic it's boat. It's a classic old boat, but it's a wood boat. Yeah. So we can build. And boats. That's a bad boat. Well, no, wood it's not is bad in, the, in, well, in this world. In the offshore I don't, world, I don't know why people would build a wood boat now with the technology we've got. Right. We can build a boat. It's hard to get the same shapes in a wood boat. You know, with a molded boat, you can do any kind of shape you want. It's a little harder to do that in a, in a one-off right. wooden boat where you're building a thing from scratch. Why would people want to build a wood boat in this day and age? Tradition. There are right. a lot of builders that uh, that's that's all they build. The Carolina builders primarily build out of wood. 
They've always done it. Right. The other thing is you can build a wood boat. If somebody wants a, a 79 and a half foot boat, you can build a jig and build a wood boat. To fairly, whatever dimension you anything want. Anything you want. Yeah. Just build a jig and build a boat off that. The problem with that is you're essentially getting a custom boat because that boat has never been tested before. Right. It might be good, but it might not be good. So we can build a boat. We, we, when we build any boat, we test it. And we never don't change it. Right. We change it a lot. So I don't know how somebody builds a boat out of the block the first time that's right. We can't do it. I don't think anybody can do it. Because there's a lot of guessing. A lot of guessing. So it took two and a half years to get the boat we have, the skiff we have now. We're doing a 27 right now. It's going to take us many, many changes once it hits the water in about another three or four weeks. And then we've got a 40 coming along. And that's, that's the same thing. We'll, we've got a design to start with, but what we end up with won't look anything like what we're starting with. What kind of issues are you having with COVID right now and getting product and materials and stuff like that? It, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge. Sadly, what you find out is everything reverts back to, in manufacturing, to China. It may say made in the USA on the package, but some of those components came from China. And so when those shut off, everything stopped. We, I just got 18 engines in a few days ago. We were out of engines for a long time. That's So I will get my boat. We have your engine sitting there in a box. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was the hard one. The engine company shut down. I, I remember you telling me you had like... Like 15 boats without engines. Yeah, that was that was expensive. Finished boats, rigged, ready to go, and no engines. Mm. It's, it's getting better, but it's still a problem. Yeah. But we've got all you your wanna... parts. We have your boat already. It's just in a liquid state. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Next week. What? Uh, so in the horizon uh, with your company, what is, what is, you know, so in anything that we all do, we always have hurdles. What's the next hurdle for where you're at? Or is your boat so refined you can, there's no more question. This is, this is the answer. Well, I think on the flats boats, we're there. I don't know how to improve it. I, I, we, we, we didn't stop until we had the boat where we didn't, we couldn't think of any changes to make it better. If there was anything about that boat we didn't like, that's why it took two and a half years to build. We, uh, we would say, well, I don't like this. I don't like that. And we'd keep tweaking, tweaking, tweaking until we got it. In fact, it was, there was a point we weren't sure we would get it. We were sitting there. And were we you were, scared? You had all this money involved and all this time? And no, it, you, you know, it's kind of exciting. That this is really exciting when you're doing something that hadn't been done before. Right. And we, we had this boat, and it was running. And it was, I had it at a big facility called Vectorworks, big tooling facility in Titusville. And the guy that owns it's a great guy, boat nut. And he was, everybody at the place, we're building the smallest boat they've ever built in their facility. <laughs> and everybody's excited about this boat. And after about a year, he goes, Hal, isn't this boat great? I said, oh, yeah, it's, it's great. He said, isn't it the best thing you've ever seen? I said, oh, yeah, it's by far the best boat I've ever seen. He says, why aren't you going to build it? I said, well, it's not not right yet. It's, it can be better. There's still things that aren't right. He would just shake his head and laugh and walk away. He still tells the story. So you're a perfectionist? Yeah, I think uh, my partner and I are perfectionists. And what we, what we find is, and I found this true of almost anything, employees are it's a very difficult thing to build something like that with employees because when you take an employee and you say they build something and we try it and it doesn't work and we tell them to tear it apart and redo it again after about the fifth or sixth time a lot of people can't do it anymore even though it doesn't it doesn't make any difference they're making the same amount of money but they lose their patience mentally they lose it they just don't they want to do it anymore get frust out of they really get frustrated they want to move on to the next project I've seen it happen. I think that's what happens with a lot of people and a lot of businesses. They they don't have the patience just to keep going. Is your biggest frustration your employees then? No, not now because we've got good employees, but we it's hard to get that 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 mindset. Right. You go through a lot. For us, about one out of fifteen makes the grade. Wow. All right, I got a question for you, Hal. Say you never started Chittum. You had nothing to do with building boats as a as a business. What would you buy for a tarpon boat and why Damn, I, I wish you hadn't asked me that <laughs> <laughs> perfect nikki yeah here pound it pound it baby um i i mean i owned almost every boat there was and there's not much i haven't tried and um I, I don't know what i would do i would go out and build one 
because I'm just not satisfied with something that's inferior. Good answer. Do you think you have the per the perfect tarpon boat now? Well, or the perfect bonefish boat? Is there one we, category that's so perfectly refined you can't you, you don't think you can improve we, it? We don't know how to improve this boat. We 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 haven't changed the boat in twelve years. Same boat. We have two boats, a twelve degree and a two degree right. that kind of cover everything from a Texas boat that runs two inches of water all day to uh, to our tarpon boats and yeah. you know. My partner George has run him to run our 12 degree of the 70 Yamaha to the Bahamas and back and, you know, and 20 knots of wind. That says a lot. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. 20 knots yep. in that Gulf stream, mm -hmm. ran to the Bahamas and back. Yeah. Came over, he crossed over and had to clear at cap because it, he was going to Andros. Andros custom for closed on the weekend on the, on the trip home. He called me on a sat phone because he, he was, they were on the camping on the north end of Andros. They were over there to fish. We had the boat there for six months. He had to get it out because of taxes. So he called me up on a Sunday morning. He said, what's it look like? And I said, oh, you got a band of 10 or 12 knots, like from just north of Miami and just south of Miami for about a 70 mile range. And above it, it's blowing 15 to 20. Oh my and God. And I said, I said, I don't think you can make it across because it's going to, it's going to shift. And he goes, well, I'm coming. I got to get back. So. He had 230 miles from Andros to Key Biscayne. Like took, oh my God. I think it took him nine hours. He had is to that tack. a testament to the boat or, is, or of his insanity? Both. <laughs> Both. But, you know, it wasn't dangerous. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. He wasn't it. dangerous, but he had to tack, you know, all the way. Right. And he's got right. some videos. It's pretty exciting, you know. And he, he had some areas in there that had, you know, eight, nine footers out there on Crazy. the way back. He I can't wait to see our boat. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I well, think... thank you. Thank you so much, um, you know, for doing all you've done with the industry and the, you know, as a guide, as a store owner and, and now a boat builder and as a friend of ours and building us our new skiff. I can't wait. To... I can't wait for you to use it, man. This yeah. is why we do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for hanging here at the Millhouse. It's not a bad place to be. <laughs> Thanks, Thank, thanks, thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you. So much fun. When I saw his